Welcome back, everyone. I hope that you had a relaxing and restful break and um, got that caffeine that you need to keep going as we are dealing with this gray, rainy weather this morning. Um, I am so honored to be able to introduce you to the speakers for our next panel on navigating the mental health impacts of climate change. We have some fantastic folks here this morning who are going to share their expertise with you. Uh, we have first up in our lineup, Christy Manning, um, who's been teaching in the Environmental Studies Department at McAllister College in Minnesota since 2008. Um, she focuses on uh, the psychology of climate change and has literally written the textbook on it and is going to introduce us to the concept of the mental health impacts of climate change. Um, following Christy's presentation, we will have Dr. Dion Hart, who's a psychiatrist, addiction medicine specialist, and patient advocate. Um, she trained at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And she was the inaugural chair of the American Medical Association's Minority Affairs section. She's the first and only black woman to serve on the Minnesota Medical Association's Board of Trustees and is the current National Medical Association Region 4 chairperson and Minnesota State Ch uh, Chapter President and immediate past co-president of the Zumbro Valley Medical Association. Um, along with a whole bunch of other accolades. Um, she's a member of the Mayo Clinic School of Me Medicine Admissions Committee and an adjunct assistant professor of psychiatry in the Mayo Clinic Department of Psychiatry and Psychology. Um, and she was named Psychiatrist of the Year in 2014. Um, and again, multiple, multiple accolades. You can read uh, Dion's full biography in our uh, program. We're so great, grateful to have her here this morning. Um, concluding the program will be Christy White, who is a board certified clinical health psychologist and assistant professor in the Division of General Internal Medicine at the University of Minnesota. Um, she <clears throat> is currently practicing um, and her scholarly interest is in the overlap among health psychology, behavioral, inequity, uh, behavioral medicine and environmental sustainability. Um, she likes to focus on environmental justice, the stress reducing and health promoting effects of restorative natural environments, the role of environmental sustainability and human well-being, and the health impacts of climate change. Um, so we're so lucky to have them all here this morning to share their expertise. Um, with that, I will turn over the programming to our first speaker in this panel, Christy Manning. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. I am uh, beginning to share my slides, which of course are now on the wrong I'm on the wrong slide, so I'll go back to the beginning. Here we are. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Brenna, and it's really an honor to be part of this panel, and I've been so inspired by the talks this morning. Uh, it is encouraging to hear all the systems level change that you all are engaged in, so thank you. And thank you to health professionals for a healthy climate as well. So as Brenna said, my name is Christy Manning and I teach and work in the sustainability office at McAllister College. I've also been thinking a lot about the mental health impacts of climate change, both in terms of how we, because when we understand climate change as a human health issue, the research shows that we are more motivated to engage with solutions to the climate crisis. So, I have been thinking and doing research about the mental health impacts of climate change since about 2013. What I'm gonna share with you today is a basic overview of the findings of a recent review that I published with Susan Clayton uh, and some people from the uh, American Psychological Association and also from Eco America. And a side note, and that is that Susan Clayton, the first author on this report that came out back in November and the second author, she is also a co-author on the most recent IPCC report. So you can also download this report. It's available for free online if you just Google mental health and our changing climate. It's the 2021 edition. We have two other editions out there as well. And you can get to it on the Eco America webpage. So in this report and in my thinking about the mental health impacts of the climate crisis, what how I think about it is the mental health impacts basically fall into three, three buckets. There is the trauma that we experience from extreme events. There are the impacts from slower chronic changes, which I'll talk more about in a minute. And then there is the 
the emotional climate anxiety, eco anxiety, climate grief, soul nostalgia. You may have heard some of those terms. So I'm going to talk about each of these in turn beginning with the trauma from extreme events. And by extreme events, I mean things like extreme storms by floods and wildfires, all linked to our changing climate, our warming, warming climate. So what happens to a person who has been in an extreme event? The, the first thing that happens is trauma and, and shock. And this is Often it, it, it varies with how extreme the event was, how much danger the person was in, how much loss they may have experienced. Uh, nearly everybody feels some trauma and shock when their lives are in danger. They may have lost possessions, pets, somebody near to them may have been lost, their own life may have been in, in danger. In the longer term, most of us overcome this and we, uh, bounce back. But for many, and the research, there's a range in the research between something like 7% to on up to the mid 40% of people have longer term repercussions to experiencing an extreme event. Uh, PTSD, for example, many people show signs of anxiety, depression, lingering substance abuse, physical health suffers, and people may struggle to maintain social relationships in ways that they previously had no, no trouble. This is all the individual level impacts of, of surviving an extreme event linked to climate change. Communities as a whole also show impacts that have repercussions for mental health. So in particular, for people who have to flee their homes or are forced to relocate, they can't go back to their homes, it's been, it's destroyed, they can't reach it because of floodwaters, it's dangerous for their health. Uh, and communities that have been displaced and individuals who have been displaced show higher levels of trauma, higher levels of lingering mental health impacts. And there are also, they also struggle with, um, support systems, their support systems may be weakened. And I, there's, uh, I don't have time to go into all the details on that this morning, but I, I uh, refer you to the report because I, I found the research really, really interesting about the, the cycles that communities go through after uh, being dispersed and maybe coming back together, the kinds of help that they're offered from outside the community and the timing of that health help, all of those things really impact people's well-being at the individual as well as at the community level. And I'll also point out, and I know there's a whole other panel, and I also know that, that Dr. Dion Hart is going to speak a little bit about this, that the burdens, the mental health burdens of the climate crisis are not distributed equally. They fall most heavily on those in our society who have historically and in the present day been denied access, willfully denied access to resources. Uh, and you can see the list of people who, um, of groups who, who tend to be hit hardest by the climate change impacts and the attendant mental health consequences of that. And it's both because they tend to be more in line, in the line of, of fire, and they are more exposed to disasters and then have fewer resources afterwards to, to recover. And there, I'm sure there will be lots more about this today. But I mean, it's worth mentioning here, and it's also a big part of the report. So the second category of climate change mental health impacts uh, are the impacts from slower chronic changes. And specifically, I mean heat, increased heat, the warming and global warming, the increasing drought and desertification that we see in many parts of the United States and around the world. Uh, and, and then also there's a, um, a decrease in air quality that goes along with the impacts of, of climate change, both from the uh, climate change itself uh, keeps particulate matter and, and um, more in, in the air that we breathe, but also as we contribute to climate change through burning of fossil fuels, we are also con uh, contributing to higher levels of pollution that impact our health and our well being and our mental health. So some of the chronic impacts of, of these longer term, slower growing changes 
uh, are first of all, physiological stress. Heat is a physiological stressor. When you are in your body is exposed to higher temperatures without a lot of relief, you feel uncomfortable, you get irritable, elderly people um, are more susceptible to, and because of the blood flow to the brain to um, accelerating dementia. And we also see a higher use of emergency health services when as heat rises and not even necessarily under heat wave conditions. And all of these things, both the heat and also the increase in drought, the lack of availability of water, puts people in a, in a state of uncertainty and stress. I have a sister who lives in Santa Cruz, California, and all the time, she's always watching out. When is it gonna rain? When is it gonna rain? Hallelujah, it's raining. Oh my God, it hasn't rained. So this uncertainty and stress of what is gonna happen, when are we gonna get relief, takes a really high mental uh, health toll on people. And, one way that we're seeing this is around the world in drought stricken places, we see a spike in suicides, especially among farmers. Uh, and for people like farmers whose identity is really tied with the, their connection to the earth and the land, um, that sense of, oh my God, who am I if I can't farm? And that also takes a mental health toll. And we see that also among indigenous communities, among anybody really who has a strong identity tied, connected to the environment as the environment changes. How does, how does your identity handle that? Disrupted connection to place is, is similar uh, as the place changes because of climate change. Who, who am I and how am I connected to this place? It, it, it's not recognizable anymore. And a loss of autonomy and, and sense of control. And entire communities, just like with the sudden onset disasters, we see these impacts at the individual level. We also see them at the community level, particularly among indigenous cultures of the cold north of the Arctic Circle, Alaska, but also communities along the Gulf Coast whose villages are literally falling into the sea. There is a loss of culture. If you can no longer count on there being ice for your hunting season, if you can no longer count on being on solid ground, you can't practice your traditional life ways and your traditional practices. And this leads to also a sense of distress, uncertainty. And we see in the research, a, a lowered sense of self-worth. Who am I if I can't practice my cultural practices? And then finally, these longer term changes, especially heat. Heat makes human beings more aggressive. It's linked to irritability, it's linked to the discomfort, and there's a abundant research showing a connection between increased heat and aggression toward other people, both interpersonal, domestic uh, abuse and violence, but also civil wars and other large scale conflicts. All right, uh, finally, climate anxiety. Climate anxiety is um, across all age groups, but we're seeing it particularly among young people. It's concern coupled with worry. It comes along with feelings of fear, powerlessness, maybe resignation, maybe it even turns into paralysis and apathy. Uh, it's very stressful. Uh, people feel very sad. It's not um, necessarily a clinical diagnosis. It is not a, um, an illness. It is, I would argue, a normal response to the circumstances that we find ourselves in with the climate crisis. Uh, it, sh it shouldn't be pathologized, but it can be debilitating for some people. Uh, and we really do need to think about what, how can we help people deal with their, this anxiety. Um, and a more recent study shows that, especially among young people, this climate anxiety comes along with a well of anger toward the people in power, the pe politicians, corporate leaders who are aware of the problem and not taking the kind of action that will ensure a, a good future for young people. Um, I'm gonna end with three testimonials from young people that I work with who are experiencing some level of climate anxiety. Um, 
These are all former students of mine. They have all given me permission to use their photos and testimonials. Uh, first, we have Dio. And, and I'll say that the things that they say are not unusual among the young people I work with. The, the, they are having these conversations regularly. Worries about whether it's ethical or right or good for their future children to have children. Sasha, Dio and Sasha um, still live here in, in Minnesota. I'm so glad Sasha is a, a member of the Sunrise Movement group of young people really getting in the face of politicians to demand climate solutions. And then finally, we have Evelyn, who um, about a year ago after graduation moved back to Los Angeles to be with her family. I miss her. So I, I just wanted to share with you these this little snapshot of what young people are saying. And I'll end um, and with my plea to all of you of what can we do and somebody who I really respect and like in the community suggested that each one of us should get out of our comfort zone once a month on behalf of the climate crisis do something that makes you uncomfortable something that is not in your normal wheelhouse but that like going to talk to a legislator that's that's uncomfortable for me I need to do that once once a month and, and if each of us does something like that once a month, we will see a lot more progress against climate change. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Manning. Um, we will definitely try to take questions at the end. You can start putting them in the chat in the Q&A. Um, and now we would love to hear from Dr. Dion Hart and her perspective on this topic. So hopefully you can see everything. Um, good morning. Thank you so much for the wonderful invitation to be here um, and for the wonderful introduction. Thank you, Dr. Manny. I already learned more and I do have the handbook in my office at work. <laughs> um, so you're going to see um, some similar concepts, but I'm really hoping that I will have an opportunity to really expand on how um, we may see these patients in the um, office or or your hospital setting, um, but also really give you a couple of pearls of information about how this impacts um, that as an African American woman, I feel it's more important at this point to start talking to patients about it because as we know um, patients tend to listen to people who they feel have a shared experience and we don't often talk about mental health um, and, it, and climate change in general in our community. It seems to be like this distant problem, somebody else's issue. Um, and I really want people to start having conversations about it um, because it is very important for all of us. Um, and this should look very familiar to some. Um, and when we talk about the impact of climate change on human health first, it's nice to be in an audience where people say climate change is an issue, right? And not have conversations repeatedly about is, is there true science about this? It exists and I think we all feel the impact. But um, if you look at this um, wheel, you think about how many of these issues impact people of color in particular, um, respiratory illnesses, malnutrition, extreme heat, all of those issues we see in um, not only in media, but our patients will tell us stories. Um, and we know that there is a more significant impact on people who are minoritized. But at the same time, we really don't talk as much as we should about the mental health impacts of climate change. Um, 
I remember being in an APA meeting once and someone suggested having a committee about climate change. And someone literally said, what does that have to do with psychiatry? Like, really, sir? <laughs> like, you know, it's just, it's just, it's very interesting how we focus on structures and if that loss is, can be very significant. I'm not minimizing if you lose your home and your possessions, but we don't really focus on the people as much and the survivors, people who have to live with the losses and how they cope. We tend to focus on things in the headlines. And then when it goes out the headlines, we kind of think, oh, I'm sure they're fine. But the, as was said, there are initial and then long lasting impacts of um, these disasters. And, and this was already discussed. It's in, it is very often psychiatrists are accused of pathology, of pathology um, pathological, I can't even think, pathologizing, thank you. Sorry, sleep deprived, I worked last night. Um, pathologizing everything, right? Nothing is normal, but this is normal. These are real threats. And if you feel anxious, if you're concerned about your health and your welfare and your planet, that is real. That is a normal response. That it does not mean that you need treatment. If it starts to impact your daily life, if you're overwhelmed by it, then it we become concerned. But the idea that you're concerned that there, you feel stressed, that is normal. Um, unfortunately, um, our APA has not caught up to the other APA, as we call it, and recognizing that this is an issue, um, but hopefully we will get there soon. Um, this was mentioned. So when we talk about um, climate change and we talk about environmental issues, sometimes people get anxious and it could be not just because um, they had the direct response because they know someone who experienced it and they feel that they are also at risk if you have a loved one, but also just becoming more aware of the dangers. If you're just walking around as if, you know, it doesn't exist, that there, you believe that there's no science or you listen to some newscast that, you know, discount the science, but then you start to do your own research and you feel it's a real thing, you may become anxious about it. Then you may um, take on a position where you indirectly experience more anxiety because you're concerned about your role and maybe you feel like you're not doing enough. And then what do you do with that feeling? Um, there was a survey um, that said um, in 2018, it said 70% of people in the US are worried about climate change and around 51% feel helpless to do something. And more recently, um, our APA did a survey of its members and 67% felt somewhat or extremely anxious about the impact of climate change on our, on our planet. And 55% felt the same concern about the impact on mental health. So people are starting to talk about it. I think it's starting to be an issue where um, everyone realizes it impacts all of us, not equally, but it impacts all of us. And um, when you have these issues, it is you know, definitely stressors, and we talk about the accumulation of stress, but it is, it is definitely worthwhile thinking about, is this a normal response or is this one for clinical concern? And you always have to differentiate and people should seek assistance and intervention when it becomes overwhelming, when your, your mood, your symptoms are dysregulated, um, like was stated. Sometimes people go to the extreme where they're like in denial or they feel numb or they excessively worry and their thoughts become intrusive. People may have panic attacks if you know they've been in a storm and suddenly they hear um, you know, like a storm like uh, Sandy or Katrina. And then this, you know, suddenly they hear um, a storm coming in the um, in their environment, in their community. And then suddenly you're like flashback. Um, if it starts to interfere with your daily function, you like you or your relationship and you feel like you're, in, you're um, paralyzed. Um, as was mentioned, PTSD goes up after natural disasters. And I think if we remember 
um, 2005, the images from Hurricane Katrina, people, minoritized people on top of their roof, trying to get help, being stopped going to bridges and to other communities. That was scary. And they were not the same images at like Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, and other things. So you think about those images and you think about who feels that they are safe in their environment, and you start to see that there may be an equity or disparity piece that's missing. So as I say, there are people um, who are more vulnerable to changes depending on where you live. If you have pre-existing anxiety and then you experience a natural disaster, then you are more uh, likely to have um, concerns about it in the future. In addition, um, young people are in some ways leading the way where they're starting to push us to have more conversations, push us to make changes, but also taking on some more of the burden of um, being concerned about their role and feeling more helpless. In fact, um, there was a survey of 10,000 people, um, 10,000 young people, um, and I'm gonna define young because I think we all feel young, um, people who are between 16 and 25 uh, in 10 countries. And not only did the young people feel troubled and worried, but they, the worry interfered with their function. Over 45% said that their feelings about climate change negatively impacted their lives. Three quarters felt their future was frightening. 56% said humanity was doomed. Um, and you think about, I think when we were young, all the things that we thought about were possible, and they're already starting to minimize. Um, there was a study in 2021 performed at the Yale Program on Climate Change and Communications um, that also talked about 59% of young people feeling worried and helpless. I'm going to move on. So, and then we talk about people um, who are minoritized and also living with, with mental health disorders. And I think we saw this um, firsthand with COVID. People with mental health problems are much less likely to have extra medications, right? You go to the pharmacist and they're like, oh, sorry, you're two days early. So people don't have a 30 day supply if something happens, they don't have extra insulin even or hypertension medications because they can't afford it or because their insurance doesn't permit it. So they're not as prepared to respond when there is a um, natural disaster. People with schizophrenia. Um, have difficulty regulating their temperature. So if they're in extreme weather conditions, that puts them at higher risk for like hyperthermia, hypothermia. So you might see um, people uh, who are unhoused in the community walking around with layers and you're like, how, how are they not hot? They don't experience the temperature change like we do. So that makes them more vulnerable to um, reacting and responding. Um, they may have difficulty managing a, uh, a move. Like if you suddenly, your home is lost or is, is not inhabitable at that moment, how do you um, have enough resilience and adaptability to make a change? And people with uh, mental health disorders have this issue. Um, they're also more vulnerable to changes in medical uh, infrastructure. And I'm gonna mention Hurricane Katrina again, because I think it's one of the um, most obvious uh, um, examples. And I think we all saw that. So before 2005, um, there were between 196 and 208 psychiatrists in New Orleans that were um, treating or managing care potentially for 480,000 people, right? Underserved before. But think about the great migration that happened after that. How many physicians left? How many hospitals left? I remember um, residents who were in the middle of their training and had to find a new training program. And after you re rebuild a life somewhere else, it's very difficult for you to say, okay, I'm gonna go back. So there was a great um, shortage before and then after um, there were at least six psychiatric wards that closed. And we just said PTSD, severe anxiety, depression, rates of suicidal ideation and, and um, completion go up. So now you have a greater need 
and less people to um, per, to perform evaluations, to do assessments, to do treatment. So two issues that happen at once. Put on. Um, and then I, I work in corrections, so I'm always um, want people to remember the people who are unseen in our community. So if you think about uh, jails and prisons, um, you may think of those places where dangerous people go, um, but unfortunately, jails and prisons are the number one mental health providers in the U.S. And you think about that. Um, it's, 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 it's unsettling, but jails and prisons tend to be built in rural and southern states that are hot. They are not the first in line, as we know from COVID, to receive updates for like ventilation, air conditioning. So those patients are vulnerable. And as we mentioned, people living with certain uh, mental health disorders already have a vulnerability to extreme temperatures. But medications that we use to treat those conditions, antipsychotics, can change even more the way you perceive uh, temperature changes. So if you are in a prison with low ventilation, you have a mental health disorder, and you're taking an antipsychotic, you are particularly vulnerable. So I, I just want always to remind people, and I try to bring it up in every lecture, um, to not to forget the people who are still part of our community, but are not um, visible to everyone. Um, as Dr. Rani mentioned, there is an increase in the incidence of uh, aggression and violence when temperatures go up. So that is puts everyone at risk, the other patients, other inmates, um, and also um, the staff working there. So these are real problems. Lots of coping strategies, and I know that we're going to hear about more. Um, I am a big Bruce Willis fan. So if anybody saw Die Hard when he was on the plane, he, um, he got advice from someone that said, when you get off the plane and you're anxious, you get bent down and kiss the ground, right? And we thought like, what's, what kind of ridiculous kind of advice that is? But actually touching earth and immerse, immersing yourself in nature can be helpful. Now, I will be the first one to tell you, I do not have a green thumb, but this year I actually brought seeds and I am very excited to plant my first garden, uh, you know, of my, of my entire life. Um, because I kind of feel like if you talk the talk, you got to walk the walk. So I'm going to start. I might have to like reach out to people for advice. So if you have advice, give it to me in the chat. Um, because I do feel like it is important to kind of get your hands dirty and really to start to feel connected to Earth. I think we take a lot of things for granted. And I hope in the last couple of years, we've learned that that is dangerous for all of us. Um, and that we also learn that social connections, recreation, relaxation, just connectivity to other people is not just important for our own health, but it connects us. And I think um, some of that is lacking that I don't feel responsible for my neighbor. My neighbor doesn't really feel, feel responsible for my health. But as a community, as all residents of this planet Earth, I think we really need to start thinking about strategies that not, we can not only cope with the changes and with our own um, anxiety related to this, but also start to make things better. Um, I also think as mental health professionals, we can do more. We're really starting to have conversations and to train um, our younger colleagues about the issues related to um, climate change, but also the fact that this can re relate to trauma. So trauma-informed care is very important. Recognizing that this impacts everyone, but not everyone is impacted equally and trying to collaborate with um, individuals in the community to build re resilience and really talk to insurance companies about how do you make sure people are prepared for a disaster when they do not have um, a great deal of, of monetary resources and really start to advocate for patients before there's a disaster, that whole thing about prevention that we are not so good at. Um, but also legislative actions, you know, voting for people who are like minded. And like Dr. May said, talking to people about these issues that are important and making sure people understand that 
um, you're not going to go away, that this isn't just like uh, one and done, that you're gonna to continue to remind them of these issues. So I wanna thank you um, and I wanna thank Dr. Robin Cooper, who's been mentoring me and um, helping me to understand more about this issue um, related um, to mental health, um, particularly as a treating uh, physician. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Hart. Um, there's all kinds of chatter in the chat of people who have been really engaging with your points. You've given us so much food for thought and brought so much awareness to um, thinking about these vulnerability factors and in, in mental health. And I'm sure we wanna to continue to have a discussion about this, um, but I'm gonna pass things off to Christy White um, for the final speaker presentation of this session. So take it away, Christy. Awesome, wonderful, thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Dr. Manning and Dr. Hart too for such beautiful and wonderful um, presentations. And good morning to all of you. And thank you for choosing to spend your time in community with us this morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna now draw from some of the work that Dr. Manning and Dr. Hart shared with us and move into discussing how can we navigate through the emotionally taxing labor that often comes with doing climate and environmental work so we can protect our longevity and stay in the work. So this is going to be kind of more of a discussion and we're gonna do an experiential exercise. I don't have slides to share. Um, I was hoping to take the portion of my presentation and have it feel a bit more um, conversational given that the first two panelists gave such a wonderful lectures and information, educational information about the context around this. Um, and so I'm going to draw from one of my favorite treatment approaches called acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT for short. Um, I use this a lot in the work that I do with patients. Um, some patients come to me directly for support around climate related distress, um, the anxiety or the grief or the depression that they feel related to climate related concerns. And then other times as a health psychologist, I am working with folks around health promotion, disease prevention, chronic disease management, navigating the stress of living with illness and injury. And so sometimes I bring what I like to call climate aware clinical practice into the clinical space where I may be working with a patient who has diabetes, for example, and if we're getting ready to go into a heat wave, I'm talking with them about what they're going to do and how they're going to adapt their care plan to help with thermoregulation to keep themselves safe and protected during these climate and environmental related events. Um, and a lot of the, the work that I do comes from this approach, acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT for short. And this approach really focuses on helping people leverage their deeply held values to take meaningful action while also accepting the difficulty that inevitably goes along with doing so. And it's that last part that often gets us into trouble. So it's that difficulty, right? The difficulty that shows up when we're going about our lives can lead to anxiety. And when we experience anxiety, our response is often the opposite of acceptance, which is to go into the cycle of avoidance. So anxiety happens, we don't like it. And so we react by running away, escaping, passively disengaging, rigidly using safety behaviors, uh, withdrawing, denying, giving up, opting out, and so on. And what's so seductive about avoidance is that it gives us this kind of immediate relief, which is really reinforcing. And then it teaches us that avoidance is the answer to feeling better. So this then undermines our confidence, it dimin diminishes our coping capacity, and ultimately results in worsening anxiety in the long run. So that when anxiety shows up again, this cycle continues and perpetuates itself. And so the way we respond often gets us so bogged down in chasing feeling better that it comes at the cost of actually doing better which robs us of our ability to navigate through future difficulties skillfully. And so then 
the cure for reversing this cycle is to take an approach in which we face our fears in a systematic, structured way and learn acceptance skills so we can open up to facing challenging experiences in a meaningful way. And so what better way to illustrate this than by using climate change and how we respond to climate change and the stressor and the anxiety that can come with addressing climate change as an example. So I'm gonna be sharing two tools that come from ACT that I have found to be very useful in my experience of doing this work. The first is gonna be a brief mindfulness exercise focused on allowing difficult emotions to be present. And then the second one is a structured action plan that will help you leverage your values to take action related to addressing climate change in a meaningful way. So let's start with the mindfulness exercise. Um, I'll also say that if this feels too advanced for you and beyond what you can tolerate, you can absolutely opt out of this exercise. Though from a uh, combating avoidance perspective, I encourage you to participate if you can. Um, and I also encourage you to pick a difficult emotion that isn't too overwhelming and that you can tolerate. So um, this may be sort of mild worry about um, a storm that's coming or um, you know, a little bit of distress or sadness around how um, there wasn't as much ice on the lakes this winter and maybe you weren't able to participate in some of those loved activities. So we don't need to um, focus on, you know, deep existential crushing despair um, as part of this exercise. Pick something that's a little bit less extreme and not too overwhelming and that you can tolerate. And so um, for this exercise, I'm actually going to go off camera so you can focus on the experience instead of watching me. And what I invite you to do is to sit up upright in your chair with your back straight and your feet flat on the floor. And either close your eyes or fix them on a spot, whichever you prefer. And just take a few slow, deep breaths and really notice the breath flowing in and out of your lungs. Now quickly scan your body from head to toe, starting at your scalp and moving downward. And notice the sensations you can feel in your head, throat, neck, shoulders, chest, abdomen, arms, hands, legs, and feet. And now zoom in on the part of your body where you're feeling this uncomfortable emotion most intensely. Perhaps it's a lump in the throat or a tension in the shoulders or heaviness in the chest. or a pit in the stomach. And observe this feeling closely, almost as if you're a curious scientist who has never encountered anything like this before. Observe the sensation carefully. Letting your thoughts come and go like clouds passing through the sky. And as best you can, keep your attention on this feeling. Notice where it starts and where it stops. Learn as much about it as you can. If you drew an outline around it, what shape would it have? 
Is it on the surface of the body or inside you or both? How and far inside of you does it go? Where is it most intense? Where is it weakest? If you drift off into your thoughts, as soon as you realize it, come back and focus on this uncomfortable emotion. Observing it with curiosity. How is it different in the center than around the edges? Is there any pulsation or vibration within it? Is it light or heavy? Moving or still? Are there hot spots or cold spots? Notice the different elements within it. Notice that it's not just one sensation. There are sensations within sensations. Noticing the different layers. And see if as you are observing this feeling, if you can just allow it to be there. Breathing into it, opening up around it, you don't have to like it or want it. Just allow it. Just let it be. You may feel a strong urge to fight with it or push it away. If so, just acknowledge that this urge is there without acting on it. And continue observing the feeling. Don't try to get rid of it or alter it. If it changes by itself, that's okay. If it doesn't change, that's okay too. Changing or getting rid of it is not the goal. Your aim is simply to allow it, to let it be. And as you're allowing it and observing it, notice that you are bigger than this feeling. No matter how big it gets, it can never get bigger than you. This feeling tells you some valuable information it tells you that you're a normal human being with a heart. It tells you that you care and that there are things in life that matter to you. And this is what humans feel when there's a gap between what we want and what we've got. The bigger the gap, the bigger the feeling. And now returning your awareness to observing the physical sensations of the breath.
taking a few moments here to reflect on any observations that you made. And when you feel ready, we will close out the exercise and you can open your eyes. All right, thank you everyone. So with the last remaining moments I have here, I'm going to just briefly share with you another tool that you might find useful that will be shared with you um, after the conference today. And this is adapted from ACT. And it's what I like to call the Climate Change Willingness and Action Plan. And what it does is it helps you identify a goal that's rooted in your values, the actions that you'll take to achieve the goal, and then a willingness to accept the difficulty that is likely going to come along with it as you are approaching the goal. And remembering that acceptance is not the same as resignation or giving up. It's a willingness to acknowledge what is actually happening. It's the opposite of denial. And this interfaces with what Dr. Manning was saying earlier that every month try to do something that's slightly outside of your comfort zone. And my hope is that this action plan might help you facilitate some of those actions. On the second page, there is an example of um, one of these filled out that might be useful as you're completing your own in your own action. And with that, I will stop and we can open it up for discussion. Thank you, everyone. Oh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Christy. That was an amazing exercise. Um, I imagine I'm speaking for everyone and being glad that this is recorded so I can revisit <laughs> that meditation with you um, again and again. I know that um, just going through it today helped me to process some of the complicated feelings I have um, about wanting to be a steward of this family property that I caretake and trying to learn about it when it's changing all around me due to all the fluctuations that we're seeing just even this past season it's is it spring is it not how can i be a good steward of the land if i don't know what it means what's happening you know um so yeah this meditation was was super helpful and i really appreciate you coming and sharing that with us today um so we do have a few minutes left thankfully with this panel before we're going to transition um and um i would be grateful to take any questions <clears throat> that anyone might have for these fantastic panelists. Um, I think that Christy had already kind of answered one of them that yes, we will share these resources with you with Christy's permission, um, Dr. White, I should say, um, that we will be sending follow-up email with resources <clears throat> um, from the session and other things that would be relevant to attendees of the conference. So, um, Let's see, we have some questions here that we can take um, from the audience. So we have, hmm, oh, an interesting one here about kind of this dichotomy between optimism and pessimism. So one of our attendees asks, a lot of work in climate activism seems to be about maintaining optimism, but I know many highly motivated activists who are also pessimists. How much does it matter to activism whether one is optimistic or pessimistic? Or is it simply about, or simply around clarity about what one might be optimistic or pessimistic about? So if any of you have any thoughts on that, would like to take it. I can say a little bit about what the research says, and, and that is that um, fear and worry and anger galvanize. And so it it's not, it, it's kind of a matter of degree, I guess. You need the right combination of the, ah, oh, this, this, I'm worried, I've got to do something. And also there is something I can do. There is hope to, for us to move uh, towards solutions. And you, you won't take action unless you are concerned, worried, feel motivated, that's human nature. And you also will tend not to take action if you feel like there's 
it's hopeless. And, and so we've got to find that right, right space. We've got to communicate both the um, seriousness of our situation, but how much we can do to alleviate all of the suffering that we are bringing about with our, the present course we're on. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Manning. I would um, just echo what, what you said. And um, there is a psychologist, her name is Susan David, and she does a lot of work on emotional agility. I'm going to drop a link to her 16-minute TED Talk um, in the chat because I highly recommend it. Um, I watch it multiple times a year, and it really speaks to this question, right, about um, the sort of false dichotomy that we create. We, as humans, often like to think in dichotomous terms or in binary terms, but very little is actually binary. And so we need the nuance, right? Finding that middle ground, finding the space in between, the in-between spaces is where a lot of the really meaningful action comes from. And so she'll talk a lot about this idea of false positivity or toxic positivity and how important it is to um, continue to acknowledge some of the difficult emotions that show up as part of this work um, and how that's an essential part of, of the work that we're doing. So um, certainly having optimism and hope is, is essential so that we don't dive into despair and become um, you know, immobilized by it, but also uh, this sort of pathological denial sometimes that can happen of, nope, I don't want to feel this way. So I'm going to focus all of my time and energy and effort into feeling better sometimes comes at the expense of actually doing better. Um, so that's a, it's a really great uh, talk and I highly recommend it. Thank you for sharing. <clears throat> Dr. Hart, did you want to add anything to that? The only thing I would add is that even if you see yourself as more pessimistic, most of us, as was said, kind of go back and forth, like everything is not one or the other, like um, binary as was mentioned. So if you need to take a break, if you start to feel pessimistic, step back. And whether it's doing something out of your comfort zone, um, doing a relaxation exercise, going for a walk, whatever it is that's going to help you to, um, re-energize yourself so that you can be optimistic, I would say do that. But I would also agree that um, sometimes when we're pessimistic a little bit more, there feels like this urgency that kind of drives you. And then when you feel like you're making some progress, the optimism keeps you engaged. So I would say that w both are fine because we need to have both um, at times, but always kind of be mindful of how you're feeling. And if you need to take a step back, do that because burnout is real. Yes, 100%, 100% agree with that. And that's part of the, um, the not diving into denial, right? We, in order to have how we're actually feeling be within our field of awareness, that enables us to be able to say, okay, so for my burnout prevention, I need to take some rest so that I can restore and stay in this work. So totally 100% agree with you, Dr. Hart. Thank you for your point there. Yeah, and thank you all. I've seen that there's some questions coming up that are specifically about dealing with burnout as an activist, um, looking for some resources about that. And interestingly and importantly also, how do we support each other as a community of activists when we're experiencing burnout, particularly after things that are disappointing? I will start. So I, I see some of the conversation in the chat. Uh, a friend of mine told me um, with issues, um, particularly this came up when we were talking about um, issues related to systemic racism and people talked about having allies. So stop saying that. You act like if you say allies as if it's impacting one and other people are joining you but it impacts everyone. So I would say the same thing here. This impacts all of us. So in some ways we are all in it together, but I would start to stop using the word ally because it does sound like there's somebody that needs to address it and you're just helping them along when we all need to address it. So I would say we're all called to be advocates for this because this, there's no way to escape, escape this issue. 
unless you're Elon Musk and you're just going to go to a different planet. This is not going to happen for the most of us. Yeah, thank you. That's such a, a great point and a really great reframing. Um, we're really up on time. We should be moving into our break. I just wanted to um, give Dr. White and Dr. Manning if you wanted any closing statement as well here. Okay. I think in the spirit of um, burnout prevention and restoration, uh, prioritizing the break is a good idea. Yeah, excellent. Well, again, thank you so much to our speakers. This has been fantastic. Obviously, there's so much more that we want to be able to discuss and learn about this, and we will be um, sharing those further resources with participants. And as with our climate smart healthcare uh, presentation, this is work that we want to continue to engage in and health professionals for a healthy climate. So if you're interested in continuing to learn more and maybe to engage in some of this work as well, make sure to join and reach out to us and we'll be continuing to present more on this. Um, so thanks everyone, and we will move into a break until 11.20, at which point we will reconvene. Thank you.